uh, the big red button. There we go. And we do post these on our YouTube um, after the fact. So if there's materials that you missed or you want to share the presentation or review something that uh, went by you too quickly, uh, we do post those afterwards. So feel free to go back through them. Welcome everyone. Um, this is our third quarter 2024 uh, Dev Leads team update. We've got the whole Dev Leads group with us here today um, and a lot of material to get through. So um, thanks Emma for chairing the, or manning the controls, I suppose I could say. Um, and I'll get through the introductions and we'll get started with the material ASAP. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the land of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people, the unceded territory uh, where SFU in uh, Burnaby is based. Um, and I'd like to start with some introductions. So the Dev Leads group is myself, Alex Smetcher. We've got uh, Vitaly and Yarda, Bojana, Devika, and Eric, and uh, they each lead a different area of development within PKP's um, software group. Um, we have a couple of new additions as well. Uh, Magnus Liu is our first ever, which is crazy to say, but our first ever project manager. Uh, we have actually never had a project manager in 20 years of work. A number of us have played project manager, but this is a person with actual qualifications and training. Um, so we're very happy to have her joining us and also Bo Greer. Uh, this is Bo's first meeting of his first day of work as our first ever QA lead. So welcome Bo and uh, looking forward to working with you later on in the day. And of course, uh, over the next, uh, uh, next number of software releases as we add a formal QA process to the next releases, which is again, after 20 years of software development, kind of a crazy thing to just be starting. Um, Let's get started. So we have a lot to talk about. I'm going to start by going over um, the roadmap update for 3.3, 3.4, 3.5. That's uh, OGS, OMP, and OPS, all three applications. And then we'll get into what's coming in the future and some very exciting news we've had in the last uh, month or two, I would say. So starting with 3.3, um, which is the LTS release, the long-term support release that I know a number of you are currently using. Um, we've just released 3.3.0-19, uh, um, and that includes a number of small fixes and updates um, to the software. Um, please, there's no major changes to 3.3.0-19 over 3.3.0-18, but uh, a couple of releases ago, um, maybe six months to a year ago, we did notice that there were some uh, XSS uh, stored um, cross-site scripting uh, problems with the software. So we released some updates. And now, kind of six months later, we're hearing out in the wild that there are some uh, attempts to use those for spam. So it's a good idea to keep up to date. Um, the uh, I know a lot of folks struggle to find resources for updating. Um, and so if you are using 3.3.0-18 and you see dash 19 comes out, um, just know that those are database compatible. So you actually can just drop the new code in place without having to run an update script. Of course, going from 3.3 to 3.4 is a different thing, but 3.3.0-18 to 19, you can just update the code. And uh, if you don't have a lot of time to do um, uh, additional things, just skip the upgrade script. Um, so moving on to the LTS timeline, I had some questions about this recently, and um, I think we'll probably have to do some communication as we near the 3.5 release. But um, we did originally announce that the end of life for 3.3 was going to be January 1st, 2025. And that was an estimate based on um, when the, three point, the next LTS 3.5 was going to come out. Um, so we've had a lot of folks expressing a bit of anxiety about this um, potentially upcoming end of life for 3.3 on January 1st, 2025, which is very soon. Um, the good news is there is no rush to uh, meet that deadline. We basically maintain, we commit to maintaining an LTS release for at least one year after the next LTS update uh, release comes out. So once 3.5.0 LTS is out and designated, you'll have a year to do the upgrade. So just, just because when the original announcement was made about LTS is that was our estimate, don't worry about that deadline. Um, you'll have a year at least. Uh, I will talk about timelines for 3.4 and 3.5 just in a little bit. Um, so we expect that 3.3.0 LTS will be released at least, will be maintained, excuse me, at least until the fourth quarter of 2025. So that's a full year at least from now. Um, all right, talking about 3.4, and uh, that is our other stable branch that folks are using. It is not the LTS release, um, so it's a little bit kind of faster moving. We've released 3.4.0-7 uh, uh, recently, and that includes just a number of minor bug fixes, a lot of translation updates. And uh, this is one thing I, I, I kind of enjoy watching for is um, interesting languages. I had to look up Sidemo to find out uh, what that language was. It's an Ethiopian language. It's not one of their 
official languages, but it is recognized. Um, I do love seeing, you know, kind of languages that are relatively new to me uh, show up. So thanks as always to our translators for the translation work. Um, and again, it's probably a good idea to keep your software up to date, although I'm not aware of any um, issues being used there uh, the way that we've seen in 3.3.0. Um, Okay, talking next about 3.5, and I mentioned that 3.5 will become the next long-term support release. We alternate between uh, non-LTS and LTS releases. So 3.3 was LTS, 3.4 was not, 3.5 will be. Um, and just to talk about timelines there, uh, we're going to be entering a feature freeze on the development of that software at the end of this month, so very, very soon. And then the initial release of 3.5.0 is planned for the end of the fourth quarter of this year. So again, very soon, that's the end of this year. And then the LTS designation gets added after a few minor builds of that release have come out. So we'll give the first quarter, maybe some of the second quarter, a bit of time to make sure that any kind of early issues in 3.5 are shaken out. And then after that, we'll be putting the LTS designation on that. And that, when that happens, indicates to the community that they are safe and, uh, and encouraged to upgrade from what they're currently using to 3.5.0 LTS. Um, and we'll start that one-year clock for folks to do the upgrades before we mothball 3.3. Um, watch for an update on translation efforts because part of the release process is that we have to move our translation tools to working on the new branch of software. Um, so when we uh, begin the release process, we'll move our web late install, which we use for translations, over to working off of the 3.5.0 branch directly. And uh, then uh, translators will have a, a batch of new updates for new features on 3.5 to uh, update their translations to. We do consider that there's kind of a, um, a critical set of translations, which is kind of French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, that the ones that folks in our community mostly use. And uh, we try to make sure that we give enough time for translators to get those core languages up to date. And I'm sure we'll see some uh, updates come in after the fact. Those will get wrapped into minor builds afterwards. Um, but we would do try to give our translators some warning. We are gonna try to fit the translation workflow into the fourth quarter of this year. I know that's often a shortened uh, timeline because of course, holidays and Christmas for a lot of folks. So we'll try to get our communications going very soon on when they can expect to see the translation tools open up. Uh, okay, this is one of the things that I'm very excited to talk about. Um, we did give a bit of a discussion slash teaser of this, uh, I think the first quarter um, dev leads update. That was at the point at which um, this project had been put out to tender and we had put in an application to, uh, to the contract. Uh, I'm very happy to say that this contract was awarded to PKP um, by the European Commission. And uh, this is basically just in short, a project to relaunch the existing Open Research Europe portal using uh, free and open source software. And of course, OGS is the, the contending uh, software for that. Um, this will mean that there's some major features added to OGS around preprint workflow, um, around open reviews, around continuous publishing, around typesetting, and all of this will be supporting JATS. Um, so, these are all things I know that a lot of folks in the OGS community are already talking about, and it's no coincidence. I mean, uh, this is a common set of features that the European Commission would like that we haven't fully realized in OGS yet. But also, the PKP team has been trying to make sure that we focus on some of these things in our recent sprints because of the likelihood we, we thought that this contract was going to come our way. So we've gotten a bit of a head start on, um, just on some of those features, uh, discussing them, uh, doing some hiring, uh, specification work, all that sort of thing. And I know a lot of folks, um, including a number of you that helped to, for example, write letters of support for PKP, are also interested in these features. Um, this gives us uh, a couple of things. Uh, one thing that's, uh, of course, very important is the, the funding to be able to do some of the development work, to size up the dev team, to prioritize some of these things that are of interest to us but have not been like top, top tier priorities. Um, but also it gives us a specific model to work towards. So things like open reviews, a lot of folks have talked about open reviews and we've wanted to implement it, but it's not been clear to us what single model of open reviews to implement. And now with this project coming our way, with the European Commission throwing its weight behind OGS and also behind um, an open review model in particular, we can code this and say, this is not an experiment. This is there for the community at large to adopt and use. And uh, it really moves us forward in this kind of project. So very happy to talk about this. Uh, one or two features here are a bit more experimental. Um, we are still talking about feasibility and approaches for things like typesetting. We would love to have a full text editor integrated into OJS um, and for that to be then the source for, you know, generating HTML galleys, generating PDFs, that sort of thing. But that's going to be a lot more experimentation. So we're doing some of that work at the same time as we're starting the, the work on some of the features that are a bit more concretely specified. 
and uh, a lot of that should be coming clear very soon. So feel free to reach out to us if this is a subject of interest to you and um, watch for us to also articulate some of the specifications and details on uh, the public roadmap. Um, just to talk about the timeline. So uh, here's our, our kind of release timeline. And these boxes here are the period of maintenance for the software. So uh, we're at the end of the dev cycle for 3.5.0. The maintenance cycle ends when the software comes out and then it continues for a three to five year window. Um, we're just about to finish uh, the development of 3.5 and of course get that released out in the world. Um, and then we'll start in the development of OGS OMP OPS 3.6 for release in quarter two, 2026 approximately, as we try to release a major release every year and a half. Um, it just so happens that the OSSRE project dev window is this window here, which means that uh, to develop the software for release in for those major features in 3.6 means that we can meet the OSSRE project window and also uh, use our existing timelines for 3.6. 3.6 is not scheduled to be an LTS release, which I think is very good news for this because some of the features are going to be a little more experimental, uh, a little kind of... Um, uh, less fleshed out perhaps than it would be going into an LTS release. So we'll be able to do those, uh, get them introduced, get them working well for, for OSSRE. And then there's a bit more time for some of the breadth of those features to get fleshed out for the next LTS release, which will be 3.7. Um, as far as the roadmap goes, this is the public roadmap for PKP. And um, we have you know a different tab for each major release. Um, this is going to be as we're doing the 3.6 release for uh, the one that will conclude the OSSRE features. Um, 3.6 is going to be fleshed out uh, on the public roadmap in the very near future. And a lot of what's on there is going to be the features for OSSRE. But there is also a specific uh, OSSRE project in the uh, PKP kind of projects list. This is public um, that you'll be able to review and kind of see how it affects you. You'll note that a lot of the issues here are filed for OSSRE. But a lot of these actually pre-existed the project. And that just reflects what the, the level of alignment between what this project requires us to do and what we already had on our kind of wish list. So in a sense, uh, it does introduce some new features that we wouldn't have otherwise probably considered. But I would say a good 90% of this is just stepping on the gas for some things that the community already knows they want us to do, which is very, very good news for us. And also, I think, just reflects uh, recognition from the European Commission that OGS is pretty close to what they need. Um, I'm going to pass on next to Devika and Yarda to talk about navigation submission lists and workflow. And I believe, Devika, you're going to share your screen. Yes. Thank you so much, Alec. So um, I'll start off with the navigation. So firstly, OJS's navigation had a lot of accessibility issues. And the mix of vertical and horizontal navigation bars made the platform harder to use, especially for like new users. Uh, so now we're switching to a fully vertical navigation system, which is more intuitive. And I will share my screen to show the mock-up. Um, just give me a second. Let me know if my screen is visible. That's working. So uh, just a reminder to everyone while I've got the microphone, we will be doing a QA and a at the end. So if you have questions, please feel to drop them into the Q&A tool, and we'll try to make sure we have time to get to those. Sorry, go ahead, Devika. Thank you. And so this is how the new navigation will look. And um, thanks to Blessy and Yarda for like really working on it so that it can like come for 3.5. Uh, so if you can see, there's like a drop up, drop down icon, which you can expand to see all the options. And you can also see that for issues or settings as well, so that it's easier to now navigate and have just one space from which you're operating to like check what you're seeing on the main menu. Um, another thing was that one uh, piece of consistent feedback that we got for, about OJS was that it was too click heavy. So um, what we have gone ahead and done is that along with it being able to like quickly assess submission status and take necessary actions directly from the dashboard, we're now shifting the workflow to a site panel, allowing users to manage everything, not leaving the dashboard. So I will quickly walk you through that as well. And that's not gonna be mockups, they're gonna be the real deal. So this is the test um, install where you can see that of course this bit is gonna to change to the navigation I just showed you all in mockups. 
but uh, we can now um, see all the information as well. And when you click on view, you can see the whole workflow being shifted to the side panel. So you can upload files from it. Um, you can start discussions. Uh, you can view the activity log. Um, and you can also take your, like everything you could do from the workflow, you can now do it from this. You can also see the title, um, like the publication data. So you see the side panel and the side navigation that I just showed is now also being translated to this so that you have like a uniform navigation system throughout the software. Uh, and if I want to go back to the dashboard, you can easily go back and like see another um, submission as well. Uh, so that's how the current submission is. You can take, um, you can assign reviewers and everything. We've also updated the UI for files, uh, for revisions and for reviewers so that it's easier to read. Uh, the triangle for like dropping down to see more actions has been changed to like three dots on the side where you can like, uh, which you can click to see more information, edit or like delete. So this is how the new submission list is looking like. And I will now pass it on to Yarda to talk about all the crazy on the back end for this. And Yarda, would you like me to share my screen again or do you want to share for your own slides? Um, yeah, please, Alec, if you can share the slides for me sure, as well. Just a minute. All right, so I'm Yarda. I'm responsible for UI development. Um, and I think you've seen kind of the important bits, uh, but I want to share a little bit of the behind the scenes excitement that's that's happening in the in the development itself. Because there have, have been quite a lot of things that we had to achieve to actually being able to execute it in quite a short time. And um, so, so I picked like three uh, favorites uh, that I will go through. Um, but before we will go to the next slide, uh, I just wanted to cl clarify that uh, in some uh, context, I will be talking about kind of legacy UI and the modern UI. So just to clarify that the legacy UI uh, from, from our perspective is the previous stack uh, that basically, basically consists of server-side rendering, which is using Smarty and basically using jQuery for all the interactions. And a couple of years ago, um, uh, we started using the Vue.js uh, to be able to use uh, richer interfaces, more accessible and things like that. So that's what I refer as a, as a modern UI stack. And obviously these kind of live uh, side by side and it's uh, quite interesting to actually find find a ways to actually, uh, li uh, to for them to be in harmony. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So one um, like, developer uh, feature which I talk about in the Q1 call was uh, basically improving the translation workflow for the development for Vue.js. And that has been quite important as we are like really pushing and moving towards Vue.js. Uh, then uh, we also had to had to, like explicitly pass all the translations uh, from, from the backend down to the components. And that obviously was like quite uh, labor intensive and uh, not easy to maintain. So one of the things that I committed at the time was uh, to make uh, the translation as simple as as you would do for the server side rendering, which basically means just two steps. Uh, you know, add the new translation to our PO file, uh, which has all the translations, and then just use it in the Vue.js component. And then all the build steps uh, behind the scenes make it work. And it works every time. So this was this has been like one of my favorite things, you know, that it just works. And it's super easy to actually use this. Um, so, and again, since we are building lots of the new UIs and we are refining also the messaging to the user based on the different roles, we also have lots of new, um, uh, you know, translations for that. So um, that has been very useful uh, to us. Um, we can go to the next one. Then, uh, then one of the things that uh, that we also introduced, like in Q4, I think, uh, was uh, was start using Storybook, which basically serves two purposes, like for a documentation, but also as a QA tool, uh, where for 
you know, every pull request, uh, we have the chromatic service, which makes the snapshots of all our components and compares them to the preview. So we know if something changes and things like, like that. And on top of that, uh, we are using that for like documenting certain, uh, certain things. So the example that I decided to share in here is basically all the review round statuses that we can have and actually seeing, you know, how that actually translates to the UI. So we can see them, you know, all of them at one page and we can do the same things for uh, different roles. So we can compare what different roles would see, which is great, like for documentation, because it doesn't go out of the date. It's it's uh, real code. And um, also it's great for uh, like discussion uh, with, uh, with users or inside the team to actually decide whether something should be improved or changed. And, and one of the things uh, that we also committed, like I think in Q4, was kind of leaving the Smarty behind and just use the Vue.js components. And that basically just makes this uh, approach easier where we can basically put the whole page inside the storybook. Um, because obviously the problem with the Smarty was that it's interpreted by the PHP while the storybook is purely like JavaScript um, uh, tool, which um, so, so if, if we yeah, don't use the smart anymore, it's, it's just easier to uh, display things in, in the storybook without duplicating the templates and things like that. And the last thing here, just to mention again, this also serves as like QA tool. So if there is some change, we will know if you are changing code and it would impact, you know, how we display these um, statuses, um, we will know. So that's also important to actually, you know, ensure the quality. And last thing, uh, Alec. Um, so this one, this one is actually one of the most fundamental things that uh, that was done that enabled us uh, what Demica Devika uh, sh showed you. Um, so uh, there is in, in the system there is so many models that are built st still in the legacy stack, um, and there are lots of uh, listings of like reviewers and files that has been built in this legacy stack as well, and. In for 3.5, um, Devika introduced you know use of this site model, um, and so first thing was to actually make all the models looking consistently. Uh, that was first thing that was I was trying to solve, and for that I created like the layer, uh, which is called in this diagram as a model store where basically all the requests to open the models go through this. So whether it's uh, coming from the legacy uh, stack or the modern stack, it's all goes through through, through this uh, model store. And then the model manager uh, is responsible for actually rendering it. And as a result, it's actually quite difficult to tell what uh, model is legacy and which one, uh, which one is coming from the uh, modern uh, bits. And as a result, we, we are a lot more flexible in the development uh, in combining the legacy and the new uh, new frameworks. So for example, in the demo, you've seen like that we built new UI for reviewers or files listings. But if you decide to add a new file, uh, that it still opens the legacy uh, model because obviously we can't rebuild everything uh, in, within wide, uh, one version, but we have a lot more flexibility to decide what, what, what to actually replace, what to modernize. And as a kind of side effect of this also is improved accessibility. So the old um, models uh, had problems with uh, focus chopping. So one uh, very important things for the models in accessibility is that once the model opens, it should uh, basically trap the focus of the keyboard inside that model. So it's easy to navigate. Uh, and that didn't work very well in the in our legacy models, but since now it's all rendered through one stack, uh, that's that's now working as a nice side effect. Um, okay, that that's all. Uh, last slide. Yeah, j uh, you, one thing I wanted to emphasize that I'm kind of the last person in that all chain of the events to kind of putting things together, but I'm dependent on so many work uh, from uh, others uh, in the team to be able to do it. So we just wanted to kind of highlight and appreciate that there has been lots of work in the team that has been done that enabled to put this all together. So thank you for that. Um, and over to Bojana, thank you. 
Thank you. I would like to present our new masthead management. I like we can go to the next slide. Uh, it has been implemented as part uh, of the General Integrity Initiative. And now we had the new editorial masthead page where we list all current uh, and active services, users that are active in a given role, their affiliation, when they started to be active in that role, and if they are uh, authenticated with ORCID. Uh, the reviewers are listed differently. We list the reviewer, external reviewers that uh, have submitted um, and completed a review in the previous year on that page. Editorial history page lists uh, all uh, ended services, uh, the users that were active in that role uh, and are not active uh, uh, in the past. Uh, for the more general manager have the possibility to enter a text about the previous uh, editorial history before system was used. So the one that system cannot track. And this is also displayed on the editorial history page. Uh, general manager defines which roles should be considered for masthead in the uh, system uh, where the role management happens. And per default, we display journal editor, section editor, and the reviewers. Uh, journal manager can also define the order in which the roles are displayed uh, under website settings. And the user can uh, agree to or disagree to be displayed on the masthead once, uh, uh, once they are invited to take a role. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And this all brings some changes to the system. We need a few additional information in the database. If a role needs to appear on the masthead, we need the start and end date for every user role assignment. If a user agrees to be displayed on the masthead, and we, all, we now keep all uh, ended services, all uh, ended user role assignments in the database. Um, the the exist the earlier editorial team free text field under general settings is now renamed into editorial history, and so there is no menu item editorial team anymore, but there is the new edit uh, menu item um, editorial masthead under the journals about menu. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Now the next slide is just, uh, uh, just the screenshots uh, for you to see how it now looks like. This is the editing a role where general manager can define if a role should be on the masthead. On the next slide, general manager can define the order in which the roles will be um, displayed and the website setting appearance. On the next side, slide, uh, we see that uh, a new about uh, menu item editorial masthead and no editorial team anymore. Then the next slide. This is how currently editorial masthead page looks like, but eventually it will be a little bit styled differently or tuned. Uh, we show, as said, the roles and the users active in those roles uh, with the, their affiliation and date started. There is a link to the editorial history page and the listing of peer reviewers uh, following. The next page shows the editorial history page. The, uh, as an example, the, the ended services and the free text field, the description of, of the path history that general manage, manager entered in the general settings. And the next page, uh, how the editorial team text field changed. Now it's editorial history and shouldn't contain the history before the system uh, was used. Uh, Next slide, I think that would be all for me. <laughs> and I would uh, pass to Devika. 
Thank you, Borjana. So uh, we've explored this topic a lot on the sprint. Um, and with the help of like everyone in the community, we've developed specifications and a user flow to integrate tasks like task management into the workflow. Uh, so what we've gone ahead and done is come up with two options. And I'll give you a very small snippet of those two options. Uh, but between um, 19th September and 4th October, there are going to be like thorough um, user testing sessions for not only task management, but uh, some are also scheduled for multilingual farm fields. So if you're interested, the link for that is mentioned in the newsletter, which uh, our team sends out every month. Uh, so I'll just share my screen to walk you through and give you like a snippet of those two options that we are going to be exploring. Um, so currently the first option is um, the one where the both tasks and discussions are combined. So this specific component would take the place of the discussion component in our workflow, uh, wherein you can see the name. Um, if it's a task, you can see that who the task owner is. If it's a discussion, you can just see who it is created by. You can see due dates. You can see activities like a reply was added along with like a snippet of the reply. You could also see that the task was initiated on or you can see if like something's been completed uh, you can click started and closed right from this section but like if you want to go click add you can add like details of um the submission and like you can also like the details of the task or the discussion you can select participants you can put a discussion you can like enter task information uh, where then you can put in like due dates or you can put in like who is responsible to complete the task and you can click on like begin the task upon saving and once I save it sorry for my glitchy this it would the task would get added into the system and you can say that the task was recently added so this is one option the other option is the fact that we segregate the two, which is having discussions as one component and tasks as issues. So our discussion component stays the same. It's just that we update that in the UI and then we add another component into our workflow, which would be about um, tasks, wherein you can add tasks, the same exact workflow where you can put in the names, uh, you can select the participants, you can put in due dates responsible for and even add like discussion details to this. So um, these are the two options. And hopefully when the next uh, webinar, I'll be able to present the results of like which way are we going forward based on the feedback from the community and also um, a lot of development considerations. So I will now pass it on to Vitaly to talk about eloquent adoption. Thanks, Devika. Yeah, and uh, I want to share some recent improvements in uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, we continue our work on integration uh, on Eloquent. Uh, this is a part of a, a more global strategy of reducing, uh, reducing maintain burden of our code and rely more on third party uh, libraries. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what have been done regarding uh, Eloquent ORM uh, integration for the last several weeks? Uh, it's three main parts. It's uh, adoption of, uh, it's adapting uh, uh, Eloquent to work with settings table it's uh, adapting eloquent to work with multilingual attributes or properties uh, because by default uh, eloquent doesn't that unfortunately and uh, uh, also uh, uh, we adapted eloquent to interact with our schema it's a part of our older 
pattern uh, to interact with uh, or to or map our uh, entities. Next slide, please. Uh, so, in short, uh, uh, Eloquent interacts with... Uh, so, uh, Eloquent assumes that there is only one table per entity, and also uh, there are relationships, uh, re uh, tables that show relationships between different like, models or entities. Uh, let's say, in case of many-to-many -many relations, we need additional table for that. Uh, our data model is uh, different and includes a concept of settings uh, uh, which allow us to extend our entities, uh, for example, uh, from a plugin and add additional data. Also, they allow us to interact with multilingual uh, properties or attributes. Uh, so moving further, uh, and delegating that uh, to Eloquent, uh, we have like two ways. One is switching to JSON columns, uh, which has also downsides uh, because we, uh, we need also to clearly define the structure of the data inside JSON column or extending Eloquent uh, to support our current uh, data structure. So uh, we have chosen the second way, and uh, speaking about that, there are uh, libraries in uh, Laravel uh, uh, infrastructure. So there are some extensions to Laravel that allow uh, to work with similar data structures, and they are called more like uh, uh, metadata or meta tables, let's say, for uh, for models. Uh, one is quite uh, one li one of such libraries is uh, quite similar to our data structure, but unfortunately, it doesn't support, for example, multilingual uh, values, and that will require additional work to integrate. So we have decided to uh, implement uh, a our own extension to Eloquent, uh, and it went really well. Next slide, please. So, uh, in short, uh, this is uh, this is a typical uh, structure of uh, of settings table. For uh, this is uh, in particular for announcements. And we have, let's say, announcements, uh, announcement ID, which refers to the primary table. And we have local column uh, that uh, is associated with uh, localized values. And we have setting name and setting value uh, columns, which represent uh, respectively the name of the uh, attribute and its value. And uh, now, after refactoring, uh, we can interact with them as usual uh, eloquent model attributes. Uh, we can use the same uh, methods as in uh, as per Laravel documentation. And it, additionally, we can uh, interact uh, with localized, localized data uh, the same way that it was before implemented in OGS. Uh, short examples below, yeah. Uh, announcement is uh, the eloquent model itself, and we can uh, use that to find the model that we need. Next slide, please. Uh, or example, filter values as, you, as we did before, let's say on this example with uh, the search phrase which scans some of the settings like title or description of the announcement and then uh, retrieve the model. Uh, also, we can change the value of the setting attribute and then update the model and it will update the uh, rec respective record in the table. Also, we can now delete uh, 
uh, the model from the table, including uh, setting uh, values from the settings table. And we can do that two, way, uh, two ways, by initializing, uh, initializing the model and using the delete method, or uh, we can do it in one query without initializing the model itself. This is a much more performant way to deal, for example, with cases when we uh, delete uh, all announcements when associated contact journal is removed from the data database so yeah it's uh so what is done under the hood is uh, we extended the uh, eloquent mod uh, eloquent builder class it's a class that ties together the model itself and uh, query builder it's laravel abstraction uh, to uh, to uh, to construct sql queries and we also created a trait that we can use now on our models, which allow us to deal with data from the settings table this way. And this is all for me. Uh, Alec, uh, over to you. Thanks, Vitaly. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're at the very end here, and I wanted to just uh, repeat my invite for folks to ask questions in the Q&A tool. We've had some good questions so far. Um, I want to just editorialize a little bit on the things that Vitaly and Yarda were presenting. I know they each introduced, you know, some new technical terminology, storybook, eloquent, all this kind of thing. Uh, it might appear that we're adopting more technology, but in fact, these are all replacements for the kind of homebrew tool sets we've had for a long period of time. And one really nice implication of this, aside from the, the team uh, having to maintain less of our own code, as we adopt third-party tools, is that this becomes a more friendly ecosystem for outside developers to work with. So folks who want to work with uh, you know, their own feature additions can use these same tools. They might already be familiar with Eloquent and Laravel. They might be familiar with Storybook. They might code some new front-end stuff and have us work to the, the back-end requirements for API services, that sort of thing. Um, all of this becomes easier for third-party developers to work with. And we are working with a number of folks right now uh, at TIB. I think uh, Gazi is here, but also um, uh, with Dulip uh, and crew, we're working on some features for GDPR support and really pioneering the use of Storybook. Um, uh, Ubiquity is working on a number of things that they're kind of toying with these new features. And I'm hoping that we're going to find that the developer experience becomes a lot uh, smoother for folks who are coming in fresh to, to PKP and to OJS. Um, there were a few questions here about um, the change of uh, software to adopt front-end, uh, sorry, uh, client-side rendering, as opposed to um, server-side rendering, which we've, which we've typically done, and particularly with the impact on themes. And uh, just to uh, uh, kind of go through those answers, we aren't yet considering uh, replacing the publishing front-end, that's the interface for readers, which is the most heavily themed part of things with anything uh, that's uh, client-side rendered. And the reason for that is because um, it just behaves better with things like SEO and indexing if the front end is consistently rendered kind of server side. So we haven't uh, rolled out any Vue.js adoption to the reader front end just yet. We are doing a bit of experimentation, though, um, with a different approach to uh, theming that might be more friendly with a Laravel ecosystem. Uh, and that typically uses blade templates. So we've done a small experiment with that. Um, I don't think we have any particular plan yet to roll that out uh, more universally, but we are open to feedback on it. And um, yeah, if anybody's got any feedback for us or suggestions, please feel free to, uh, to let us know. Essentially, Smarty is still serving us okay for server-side rendering, but it really isn't aligned with the Laravel ecosystem that well that we've been looking at uh, adopting more thoroughly. And I also have some uh, hesitation about the maintenance of Smarty. If you look at the, uh, the way that project is resourced, it's a lot of... Um, gambling websites. And I don't get a massive sense of uh, security when I think about um, that being a reliable, good infrastructural tool. So um, we have a few other questions about um, editorial workflow issues. Um, just trying to see if any of those need to be reiterated. We had one question about when the new UI will be implemented. And this was coming after uh, Devika's presentation on the new submission lists UI, the side models, all that sort of thing. That should be coming in 3.5. It's essentially just shy of ready for merging and uh, should be shipped in 3.5. So I'm very happy with those changes there. And again, props to Yarda for tackling the backwards compatibility question. A lot of what we do 
has to consider um, how we roll it out through the application in a way that doesn't have the team stopping work on new features and having to just deal with tech debt. We try to make sure that our approach to tech debt is iterative and allows us to kind of progressively add kind of new standards um, while we try to renovate old uh, aspects of the software. We can't pause and do a big bang approach to that. So um, by being able to harmonize the approach, for example, to modals as he presented, to allow for legacy code to generate modals and uh, for new code to interact with, with uh, modals um, in a harmonized way, it means that we can do some of our more aggressive uh, uh, feature ads like allowing folks to access the submission workflow directly from the submission list um, in a way that then makes it possible for us to do without rewriting everything in the process. Um, the big uh, feature that that then facilitates is allowing uh, the editor to work through the submission list without having to constantly click away from the submission list, work with the submission, and then click back to the submission list, losing their kind of configured filters, losing the place that they're in. But also those are quite heavyweight operations. And so when somebody clicks away and then comes back in, that's where you get a lot of kind of load on your server. And of course, your browser's got to wait for it. So that's one of the most frustrating interactions that editors have, especially editors-in-chief who tend to start with things at a very high level and work with submissions from the lists as opposed to waiting for an invite to come their way. Just looking at the questions here. Uh, for those who develop plugins, will there be substantial changes? Very good question. Um, there will be changes. Um, I think if you went through the process of going from 3.3 to 3.4, you would have had uh, a significant uh, list of changes to match. We do try and document those comprehensively in the release notebook. So when you went from 3.3 to 3.4, uh, you would have adopted namespacing, you would have renamed your files from .ink.php to .php. There were a number of class changes, all that sort of thing. I would say with 3.5, uh, there will be some major changes in the way that uh, some of the entities are stored. So a number of entities have gone from uh, our own DAO-based uh, um, uh, object management into using Eloquent. And if you ever interact with one of those, uh, then you'll have to adapt your plugins to suit. Um, I will say we've done a lot of work to make sure that even if the, the code kind of structure changes, the concepts stay quite comparable. And we'll do our very best to make sure that the um, the release notebook, again, walks you through how to change those things. I'm trying to think if there's any additional changes folks will have to be aware of that, uh, that they'll need to adapt to. I think that's the major one. Um, we are really trying to make sure that we we make it count. So, you know, uh, one of the things you gained when you went from 3.3 to 3.4 is things like uh, foreign keys in the database. You gained namespacing for code. A lot of those things are a little bit you know, painful to make sure you apply to all your plugins, but we shouldn't have to explain why those are important. That's just a, a modernizing the code and making it pleasanter to work with, more pleasant to work with. Um, Yard, I see your hands up, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment on from uh, on, on this question from uh, like the workflow pa page perspective. So because this page has been recreated, you know, as a site model, purely Vue.js, it's, it's not smart template anymore. Then obviously if you did extend the workflow page before from the plugin, this will need to uh, change. So the recommendation there would be obviously if, if you have time and resources to kind of build your UI in the Vue.js using our, our like UI library, the components from UI library that kind of makes the best user experience. Uh, but there should be, um, I, 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 I can imagine that if, if you build something like quite large or significant, then you can still like wrap it in the Vue.js component and then display it. Because our like main uh, principle for any of these new interfaces is that we will let you like uh, very conveniently register your own Vue.js component and then there will be quite simple mechanism to tell where to display it. And that will give you lots of power. So, and you can do anything in, inside that Vue.js um, component. So even if you decide to run the jQuery code there, it will work. Um, we technically also display some legacy grids even inside the Vue.js layouts as well. Uh, so there are certainly ways to do it, but the main mechanism that that needs to be kind of a Delvis is really just the reg registering the Vue.js component and defining where to display it. And I still have, uh, you know, more work to provide examples on that and uh, expose all the APIs that are needed uh, to do these things. 
Uh, we are currently very busy to finishing what we presented, uh, so that will come, you know, shortly after that. But uh, I'm thinking about it a lot, so it, it will come. Um, there's a question from Kevin about uh, quick submit and the future of OJS. Um, this touches a little bit on our GDPR strategy. So um, the question is, um, if you're using OJS just for the publication front end and you're using quick submit to get the content in there, so you're not using the editorial submission workflows, uh, will this be a potential problem in the future? So uh, our GDPR strategy, this is for um, kind of privacy and uh, integrity, is we're going to reduce the number of interactions where somebody can perform an action on behalf of a third party. So uh, some of the common interactions are uh, creating a user account for somebody without their kind of uh, consent, um, assigning a role to somebody without their consent, um, but also this applies to some of the scholarly workflow like uh, creating co-authors uh, without their consent and uh, assigning reviewers and such. So uh, one of the interactions in OGS that's uh, not currently especially GDPR friendly is uh, the reviewer assignment process. Because in order to be assigned as a reviewer, you have to have a user account in OGS. And uh, so what will often happen is the editor will say, I want so-and-so to review the submission. They'll create them an account and they'll send the invite. So a more GDPR friendly approach to that would be for the reviewer to suggest that somebody consider a reviewer uh, process but that the invitation that they receive should then guide them through creating a user account if they're going to uh, accept that review. So we send invitations rather than performing actions on behalf of somebody. Um, so we are starting this in 3.5 for the role maintenance process. So when you're asking somebody to take on a role within OGS, um, that will go to an invitation tool set. And as, as part of that process, we are creating a very uh, general purpose invit uh, sorry, invitation work workflow and tool set that can be used to quickly add new invitations for new parts of the system. So we'll be able to roll out more invitations to more parts of the system to allow for this to happen. Um, I think the co-authorship the co question is a very interesting one because the one thing we, we talked about during, I think it was our Finland sprint uh, more than a year ago now, maybe two years ago almost, um, was the question of academic integrity and academic honesty and the issue that sometimes comes up where co-authors might uh, be pressured to um, to accept or, or to give credit for the submission to people who might be not active on the submission, but who are in a position of power over the submitting author. So, you know, if a supervisor of a lab, for example, is putting pressure on their students to give them uh, authorship on an, on an article, um, there's questions of power and responsibility there. So by going to an invitation process, we don't solve that because there's always gonna be social issues there. But at least we know that when a co-author is added to a submission, they should receive an invitation and confirm their information about their submission. Uh, that should then certify that that person who gets the credit is the person who clicked the button to add the credit. Um, so we're toying with some of these issues right now. Kevin, your question, I've gotten way off topic here. Your question was about quick submit and about using OGS for uh, the back issue entry. All of this is kind of sidestepped when we talk about import export and to some extent quick submit. So quick submit is in particular used in a few different circumstances. Um, it is used by journals that have ongoing publication, which is what you're describing, but it's also used as a way to get back issue content into the system quickly. And obviously if we're doing back issue content into the system quickly, often you're dealing with authors who are no longer active, maybe who are deceased and obviously can't uh, give consent to their, uh, their uh, co-authorships being added. So I don't expect we're gonna add this concern to quick submit um, is the short answer to that question. Uh, but we will be probably um, seeing some cases where this uh, invitation process works really well and somewhere it doesn't. And so we encourage folks to give us feedback on that process and what their concerns are about it. I know that there's some concern coming from uh, system administrators, for example, uh, where they're concerned that the loss of, of ability to directly edit somebody's account might lead to more work for them, basically. So uh, we're trying to make sure that that uh, rollout happens as smoothly as possible. It does align well with what we're seeing in other kind of web-based systems. I mean, it would be pretty unusual for anybody to email Google and say, can you fix my permissions on this document? What you do is you'd use the Google administration tools in a GDPR friendly way to fix it yourself. And so we're likewise trying to make sure that we're stepping away from kind of invasive approaches just because they happen to be more common in the field we work in. Um, Hope that answers the question. I see some comments on here as well uh, about in the chat about the upgrade process for 3.5. I don't see anything needing answering. Um, 
So please feel free, when this gets posted on YouTube, um, please feel free to comment there and also use the support forum to interact with us about any particular questions we've got here. Um, one last plug, uh, I, this is a, a slide I stole from last time. Um, unfortunately, I get to use it unchanged because it's exactly the same things I want to do for next time, <laughs> which is um, uh, we would like to present on open ID and single sign-on. We have, have some new capabilities coming on uh, for that. Um, and we'd like to summarize those in the near future. And also MetaBase and report generation. And MetaBase is um, a subject that's come up a couple of times in recent meetings. Well, actually not MetaBase specifically, but the need for um, a business analysis tool. Essentially, there are a number of these. There's uh, Microsoft's BI, uh, I think it's called something or other BI. There's Cognos uh, and there's MetaBase. And these are all business intelligence tools that are used to add reporting and analysis uh, capabilities to a SQL database, basically. I've been doing some experimentation with MetaBase as an example of this that does, that does have an open source product to see whether or not we can kind of generate a dashboard that gives um, editors a chance to explore the OGS database and especially like derive stats on their editorial process, number of submissions, region of authors, trends for uh, time publication, all that sort of thing, without exposing information that wouldn't be healthy for editors to have access to, such as in a multi-journals install somebody else's uh, database, uh, somebody else's journal, or you know passwords or that sort of thing, which of course are hashed in the database storage. So uh, I will try and get a presentation on that coming up in the near future. Um, and I'd love to see some um, energy around Metabase and how to better integrate it so that it's a tool that folks can pick up and work with. There's obviously the reporting tools within OGS, but uh, I do think that at some point, you know, trying to code those kinds of uh, report generations and especially visual visualizations are better left to third-party tools that do that as their kind of like reason for existing. Right, uh, we're at the last couple of minutes here. So if there's any last questions, I'd love for folks to um, ask them and I can make sure that we uh, address them. Otherwise, please do join us on the support forum and on the YouTube channel and we'll make sure that we get some feedback there. Uh, our next presentation is not due until, I think it's around December the 17th-ish, anyway, mid-December, so just before everyone heads off on their holiday season, most likely. Um, so we'll be able to update on some of this stuff in the process. In the meantime, uh, a substantial portion of the PKP team is going to be, well, a small portion, but a substantial uh, brain trust, is going to be in Turin, Italy for a sprint in uh, early October. So I know some of you will be registered for that, and we may see you there, so looking forward to that. And we'll be doing some workshopping of this uh, material in the process. And uh, as usual, we try to summarize the sprints with a series of blog posts that uh, let folks see what we're working on. So hope to see some of you there. I don't see any last questions. So uh, I see Yard is typing an answer to one of these questions right now. So I'll let him finish that off. Otherwise, I will mute the microphone and uh, say goodbye and thanks for attending. <laughs>